Dr. Ruckel, it is our pleasure to have you and your whole crew here today. Thank you very much. So um, we are going to do something a little bit different. It's uh, Sunday afternoon. I know you probably want to be outside after the rain and the beautiful climate out there, enjoying things down here. So we're going to try to keep your attention. We're going to do this in more of a millennial format, kind of bring you back a few years, OK? So this is, deli this is designed for the online attention span. We're going to have each fact, we'll have one or two slides, or uh, Dr. Baldwin has some videos. It'll be going fairly quick, so take notes. We're leaving uh, 20 minutes at the end for interaction, for questions and discussion on these things. <coughs> um, I've challenged them to break fairly complicated ideas that we talk about in grand rounds and in our journal club and that the, these guys um, review papers on and write papers on to something that is easily understood and talked about. So this is kind of a list of all of the stuff that urologists deal with. You know, adrenal glands, kidneys, ureters, bladder, prostate, urethra, testicles, cord, retroperitoneum, kind of a mishmash of all the GU system. In urology, there are seven specific fellowships, oncology, urinary incontinence, which is female pelvic medicine, reconstructive surgery, pediatrics, male health, minimally invasive and, and advanced endourology and stone disease, including robotic surgery, reconstructive urology, and actually uh, urologists can be liver transplantation doctors. Um, so just a little bit about why you need to pay attention here, because there are 12,000 board-certified urologists in the country, but actually only 11,000 of them work as urologists. The average age, I got this wrong, it's 58. We're the second oldest specialty behind thoracic surgery. A little scary. Um, we saw something that just came out. We're number one in burnout. So show your urologist a little love. It looks like they need it. And the math is, is that Every year, about 500 are retiring, replaced by about 300. So we're headed for approximately a 25% shortage in the next, uh, by 2025. So the title of the talk, everyone needs to know a little urology. So the Loma Linda Urology Department is, um, has grown. We have uh, two residents per year. Out of a, in a six-year program, we've got a couple of fellowships, an endourology and robotic surgery fellowship, and a stone fellowship. We do a, have a medical student re, uh, rotation that's, um, they do clinical medicine, and then we uh, preceptor freshman medical students uh, on our service. We cover all of the LOUH hospitals, Arrowhead Regional, Loma Linda Veterans, Riverside University Hospital, and Redlands Community Hospital. We have 17 faculty with four starting in 2019 and seven nurse practitioners. So it's grown into what I call a bigger than average middle-sized department. So I've got some experts for you. When we decided to do this, um, we thought, well, we're going to shake things up. We're going to give more specialty exposure. So first we've got uh, Brian Hu. Brian is a urologic oncologist. Um, he did his residency at UC Davis Fellowship at USC, and he's the associate uh, residency director. Uh, Brian has several trials going here, um, where he's the Loma Linda site. Um, Ed Coe, at the end there, is the residency director. He does male infertility and andrology. He does residency at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona and fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. <coughs> and then Dr. Baldwin in the middle. He does endourology, minimally invasive, and robotic surgery. He did his residency at Loma Linda, fellowship at Vanderbilt, and he is the endourology fellowship director. So keeping in with the fast format, we've got uh, Brian Hugh first. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Ruckel. All right. So today I'm going to kind of talk to you about where we are as a field in 2019 for urologic cancers and where we are at Loma Linda. Uh, I do have to say it was nice to know that the bladder finally got its recognition. 
I learned from Dr. Lee that the bladder has to be empty for blood pressure measurement, so I expect our uh, referrals to really skyrocket now. So probably the first far-reaching um, urologic issue with respect to cancer is prostate cancer screening, okay? So I think of this in a lot of ways uh, like the McRib. Like it's on the menu, it's off the menu, some people feel very strongly about it, uh, but I'll ho hopefully shed some light on where we are with that. So the background is, um, so laser pointer here. So the background is, so in the 80s and 90s, the amount of PSA screening really went up uh, a lot. And as a result, we saw an increase in the amount of uh, prostate cancer that was diagnosed. And then this last one here is distant disease. So the incidence of distant cancer or metastatic prostate cancer went down. So all this makes a lot of sense. So we know that with PSA testing, fewer patients were being diagnosed with metastatic disease. However, in a randomized fashion, does it save lives? There's three things that can tell us, does it save lives? So the first is a large uh, European study, and this said yes, there was a 21% reduction in prostate cancer mortality. Uh, the second one was a large Swedish study, and also, yes, a 44% decrease in prostate cancer mortality. The third study is a, um, a study from the United States, and this came out about 10 years ago, and they said no. Actually, they found no difference in prostate cancer mortality in those who were screened compared to those who did not screen. However, what has come out recently? Recently, a lot of studies have uh, uh, come out showing that this study, called the PLCO study, uh, has a lot of flaws, and some would say fatal flaws. What this shows is that there was a contamination problem. Basically, the control arm of the study, uh, three out of four patients actually had PSA testing during the trial. In addition, over about 40% of these patients had PSA testing prior to the trial. So I think what most urologists would say from this study is that ad hoc screening compared with rigorous screening does not have a benefit. Uh, and a big reason, um, uh, um, and I'm sorry, in the field has shifted a lot, and I think what's uh, signaled that is that the U United, States, United States Preventative Service Task Force has now changed the recommendations, it's upgraded the recommendations for PSA screening. So uh, what is key, it's uh, shared decision making is key. So right now it's a grade C recommendation, which is still, it's an upgrade, but it's not, still not great. Uh, and for your reference, a grade C recommendation is similar to what we'd say for a woman uh, 40 to 49 uh, getting a, ma a mammogram. Uh, but besides shared decision making, we do know that uh, we should start um, at uh, about 55 years of age. However, in African American patients or patients who have a strong family history of prostate cancer, um, uh, we need to individualize and we need to screen these patients early. Uh, we don't have to do it every year. Uh, we can space it out every two to three years. Um, and we do not have to do this in men uh, with a life expectancy less than 10 or 15 years. So prostate cancer we know gives a lead time. So just doing PSA testing gives a lead time of you know, five to 10 years in terms of uh, uh, clinical diagnosis. So us seeing an 80-year-old uh, you know, um, from a nursing home in oxygen with PSA testing does not really help. So those are the patients we can really um, um, uh, pare down on. Uh, the question of what is elevated, there's no great answer. It's obviously a continuous variable. Most of the triggers for biopsy uh, in these studies was anywhere from three to four. Um, and, uh, but the good thing is that uh, there are multiple, multiple biomarkers out that go beyond PSA testing. Uh, and that your, friend, your friendly urologist will help determine uh, where the absolute PSA value is in relation to some of these other biomarkers. Uh, so what is, else is out there to determine prostate cancer risk? I think MRI is the big thing uh, right now in 2019. So I think the era of an MRI to help detect clinically significant prostate cancer is here today. So uh, it's been in works for you know decades really, but. Uh, what we do know now is that men with Gleason 3 plus 3 or grade group 1 prostate cancer will very unlikely to die from those cancers, and those we would call clinically insignificant. Uh, and the good thing is that MRI does not really show those uh, for the most part. So the higher grade ones, the ones that we do actually want to treat, are detected more often by MRIs. Uh, what, what tells us this? Um, there's two studies, one uh, in the Lancet that shows that using an MRI can lead to about a 27% reduction in uh, the need for getting a transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. Um, and the second one is using an MRI to first diagnose cancer, and if we see a lesion on the MRI, 
uh, we can do an MRI-directed biopsy. So using this MRI-targeted biopsy is shown to be far superior to, the, to our standard transrectal ultrasound-guided biopsy, again, about 38% uh, compared to 26%. Um, where are we here at, at Loma Linda? Um, really, thanks to uh, the foundations and endowments listed below, uh, we do have this technology just to kind of walk you through it. Uh, so first, the patient will get an MRI scan, ideally here, because our, you know, we like the quality of our MRI and our three Tesla magnet. So they'll get our MRI scan. Our radiologist will read the MRI. Uh, at the same time, if we click on the right button to get it protocoled, the radiologist will mark out all the lesions. We call them pyrads lesions, same as uh, you know for breast. Anything three, four, or five, they're going to mark out, and you can kind of see it in three dimensions. We then bring the patient into our clinic, and we put them in. We do it kind of similar to our old ultrasound. So they would get under this um, uranav biopsy uh, device, and this here is the ultrasound probe, uh, and it has a little chip on there, so you're able to kind of see where the ultrasound probe is in relation uh, um, to this. Um, uh, to this unit here. And what we do is we kind of sweep through the prostate uh, with the ultrasound and then technology is, allows us to really marry the ultrasound image and the MRI image uh, so we get a fusion. And uh, since we've, we've gotten this device, we've uh, noticed an increase in the detection rate of our clinically significant cancers. Uh, this is a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart and this is uh, morbidity for testicular cancer survivors. So testicular cancer, I tell patients when they have to have their archaeectomy, probably the best cancer to get a, as a man. Cure rates, 98, 99%. However, the math here doesn't really work out in their favor in terms of survivorship issues. So these patients are cured and they're young. That means they have really decades of these cumulative toxicities that can build up. What do they get these toxicities from? It's mainly you know, local, regional, and systemic therapies. Cisplatin chemotherapy, radiotherapy. We know that with cisplatin, the levels of cisplatin in the blood are still detectable 20 years after we give it. You can see it in the blood, you can see it in the urine. But we all know that the effects of radiotherapy with DNA damage, those also tend to increase uh, as time goes on. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that they get things like the big three, cardiovascular events, secondary cancers, and metabolic syndrome. And you can see the hazard incidences here. Uh, and it's not that they get them, uh, but that actually studies have shown that people die earlier as a result of this. So what are we doing? Um, you know, how can we reduce morbidity? I think the, probably the biggest thing we can do is we're really trying to uh, push uh, the field more towards surveillance of stage one disease. So if they just had the cancer in the testicle, no overt spread. Most of these patients we're putting on active surveillance. But another method is potentially increasing the role of surgery. Uh, so the surgery I'm talking about is RPLND surgery, stands for retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Um, the short-term morbidity of the surgery, it, it is there. Uh, it is a, a surgery, and um, uh, the patients, we remove all the lymph nodes and the retroperitoneum. So this is one of my cases recently. This is the uh, uh, cava. This is the aorta. This is a kind of postganglionic nerve that kind of <coughs> helps squeeze the bladder neck and promote anterograde ejaculation. So we remove all the lymph nodes in this area. Um, and with improvements in surgical technique, uh, it's really a surgery where patients can go home in a day or two. Uh, however, you kind of spend most of the morbidity up front in terms of short-term morbidity. However, in the, in the long term, you don't see these really big side effects. You might have maybe an incisional hernia, small rate of bowel obstruction. Uh, so for uh, uh, testicular seminoma, uh, we really parlayed this into a clinical trial. So when I was a fellow at USC, we started this uh, looking at patients who had seminoma of the testicle that's metastatic to the retroperitoneum. And now Loma Linda is one of uh, 14 sites uh, in the United States and uh, one in Canada. Uh, and we're uh, trying to accrue 55 patients to say, hey, potentially instead of giving these patients chemo or radiation therapy, we can give them surgery up front. Uh, we want to get 55. We're at 46 and really excited uh, about the study. Uh, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention immuno-oncology agents in, in cancer. Uh, the uh, main agents are what we call these checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, so here you kind of have this PD, uh, PD-1 and PD-L1 ligand. And what drug we have is one to block this, this anti-PD-L1. Uh, and this is a checkpoint inhibitor that's really become the standard of care now for metastatic kidney cancer. If you look at the Kaplan-Meier curve, this was published in the New England Journal. This is an immunotherapy regimen called uh, nevo ipi compared with the standard therapy, which as of maybe last year was the standard therapy, sinitinib, 
This is a small molecule that blocks angiogenesis of kidney tumors because we all know how vascular they can be. Um, so the overall survival is obviously better. And also importantly, the, the, the complete response rate is up to 9%. So uh, back in the IL-2 interferon era, that was the best we could get, 2 3%. So I think obviously a lot of strides being made. <coughs> Uh, in urothelial cancer, mainly the urothelial cancer of the bladder, these agents are also uh, found to be efficacious, mainly in the second line setting. Uh, a lot of these patients have already had cisplatin chemotherapy or they can't tolerate it, usually because their kidney uh, function isn't good enough. Uh, they, uh, the survival is better, and there's also a complete response rate up to six to seven percent. Uh, we as surgeons, we get a little excited when we can use these drugs in a neoadjuvant fashion, so we'll give it in a muscle invasive bladder cancer and then we'll take out the bladder and kind of see what things look like. Uh, we typically do it now with chemotherapy, uh, but now with the immunotherapy, uh, we can see a complete response rate about 42%. So it's pretty good, an improvement of where we are, but what's most exciting is if we assay for the pd one expression, uh, you can see in patients who have high expression, really good response, 54%. Low expression, poor response. So I think this era of precision medicine, especially in oncology, this is very exciting. Uh, robotic surgery and urology is also worth mentioning. Uh, the, uh, the era of the open radical, uh, radical retropubic has kind of gone the way of the dodo bird. We're able to do these robotic prostatectomies with uh, uh, less blood loss, uh, good functional outcomes, meaning continence and erections. Um, and uh, we're also able to push the envelope in other cancers besides just prostate cancer. We're able to take out larger, oops, larger um, kidney tumors, more central tumors, all robotically, and we also remove bladders uh, robotically for bladder cancer. Not only that, we have to remove the bladder, remove the pelvic lymph nodes robotically, and then a unique part of bladder surgery is you have to do a reconstruction. Uh, and we're able to do, this is an, a picture of an orthotopic neobladder, we take a piece of ileum, we sew it back together, and then we're able to do these anastomosis, the bowel anastomosis, the ureteral anastomosis, the urethral anastomosis, all uh, um, uh, um, intracorporeally, so with the robot inside the body. Very cool. Really speaks to kind of the, the, the institutional uh, expertise in, the, in this area. Uh, so that's all I got. All right. Wow. Awesome. 12 minutes. <laughs> all right. We got Dr. Coe. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here, and uh, appreciate you guys giving us a chance here to talk about things that are near and dear to our heart. My name is Ed Coe. Um, I specialize in men's health and infertility, and I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour through five topics uh, here today. We're going to talk about erectile dysfunction, Peyronie's disease, testosterone therapy, male fertility, as well as BPH. So hold them to your hats. All right, so erectile dysfunction is something that affects many, many men. The older you are, the more likely you're going to get it. Uh, if you're over the age of 50, you have a one in two chance of having it. So as a primary care provider, you're going to be seeing a lot of these patients. So um, as we go along, there's many etiology that can cause it. And if you look in this little schematic here, if you have a derangement in any of these area or you're on medications for treatment like high blood pressure, like metoprolol, you're probably going to have some problems with your erections. The treatment of erectile dysfunction has gone through many iterations. Probably the biggest um, uh, landmark treatment came out in the 1990s, otherwise known as Viagra. And this last year, it celebrated its 20th year anniversary and finally went generic, which has been a real godsend. So. <laughs> Um, that being said, these are the treatment options that are currently available in our armamentarium. If you look in the top left corner, those are the ones that most primary care providers are going to start with. And as soon as they don't work, or they don't work as well, you're probably going to refer those patients to a urologist. And we can offer them things like intraurethral suppositories, um, vacuum pumps. We can teach them how to inject themselves. And ultimately, if all of the conservative measures fail, we're going to probably do surgery in place in something called an inflatable penile prosthesis. That's the last line therapy because once we put it in, if something goes wrong with it, it gets infected, it breaks down, they don't like it, we have to remove it, we can't go back to the other therapies because the corporate cavernosa will have been destroyed by the device going in. So, are there any therapies that are coming up in the pipeline that could potentially work? And the answer is yes, there are. So, everyone's familiar with shockwave lithotripsy for treatment of kidney stones. You blast these stones with the, a patient lying in a pool of water. So we had some very, very smart physicians starting in Israel actually develop this technology where you would shoot a shockwave uh, pulse into the corpora of the penis, and the hope is that this would help stimulate neoangiogenesis uh, within the penis and improve the blood flow. 
The other thing that it can potentially do is change the endothelial cells within the penis, hopefully affecting um, the vascular response so that you decrease things like venous leak. So does it work? Last year, uh, a meta-analysis came up that reviewed all of the current randomized controlled trials that are available in the literature, and they looked at uh, nine trials that actually met the criteria for studies with about 630 patients or so in their study. And um, there were many variations between the treatment dosing and the timing and the different regimens and also the max treatment dosing, but as a whole, there seems to be a trend towards improvement of men um, improving their erectile dysfunction after they went through a course of treatment, whatever that may be. That being said, by three months' time when they did long-term follow-up, most of them had returned to their baseline. So there is a trend that they may potentially help, but we haven't seen any long-term uh, lasting effects. So um, the most recent study that's currently out in the literature actually just came out within the last month. Uh, this is a phase two trial that's out of the University of Miami. Uh, one of my friends, uh, Dr. Ranjith Ramasamy, is the PI for this study, and he actually had 80 patients enrolled in this trial, and they actually found that men who had mild to moderate erectile dysfunction had a better uh, lasting result uh, when they followed them out to 12 months. Currently, they're enrolling into a phase three trial. Um, it's part of one of the larger studies that are currently ongoing in the United States for the study of shockwave lithotripsy, uh, <laughs> sorry, shockwave therapy for erectile uh, dysfunction. However, at this time, we still don't have enough uh, long-term data to prove that it is actually worthwhile to use it, and it actually isn't paid for by insurance companies. So the erectile dysfunction panel that met at the AUA last summer actually came out with a statement and said that um, it can be considered, but it's still considered investigational at this time. So until further studies come out, uh, it's not ready for widespread use. So what about stem cell therapy? You know, stem cell therapy is used pretty commonly in the orthopedic world. A lot of athletes get stem cell therapy, and the whole idea is using these uh, cells that could potentially turn into other cells um, and use it for good. So some urologists thought, hey, why don't we inject it into the penis and see if it'll help improve blood flow to the penis, help restore some of the nerves that may have been damaged from chronic diseases like diabetes. And so um, they did that. Um, however, most of the studies that are currently available in the literature are observational, and there aren't that many patients that are enrolled in these trials. And a lot of them are also done with for-profit centers. We pay a lot of cash, three to $5,000 for <coughs> treatment, but we don't have good long-term studies. One of the other caveats about this treatment is that the stem cells survive very poorly within the corpora cavernosa as well. We don't have a way of keeping it confined inside the penis where the mechanism action needs to take place. So um, as of right now, the erectile dysfunction panel also concluded that this is considered investigational. So the last thing is platelet-rich plasma. So Anyone here a Laker fan? So when Kobe Bryant got hurt a few years ago, near the end of his career, he went to Italy and got platelet-rich plasma injected into his knee. He's had knee problems through different points of his career. And he touts it because he was healed and he's able to come back and play some pretty amazing seasons after he came back. So there are studies out there that are ongoing at this time using platelet-rich plasma in the same way as the stem cells, injecting it directly into the penis to see if that'll help improve erectile dysfunction. Um, However, we don't have any human placebo controlled trials at this time. They're still doing it in animals, and until it can be done in humans, it is still considered to be experimental. Not even investigational, it's still considered uh, experimental. So as a whole, for erectile dysfunction, the standard of care treatments that I presented in that slide with the five pictures on there are still considered the regular treatments. If they fail, oral medications, refer them to urologist, get them done pipeline, help improve their quality of life. In the other trials, they do look uh, promising, but still further studies are required. All right, let's talk about Peyronie's disease. What is Peyronie's disease? It is curvature of the penis caused by scarring that can occur because of a single traumatic sexual event or it can happen as kind of like a, a repetitive use injury. So this occurs in greater than six out of 100 men. It is underreported because most guys don't like coming to us as physicians anyways for regular problems like headaches or high blood pressure they're certainly not gonna to wanna to come to see you because their penis is crooked, right? If they're able to have sex and it doesn't hurt, they're probably not gonna go see anyone. However, if they get to a point where they are seeking help, that means they're probably pretty serious about it. Even though this does not affect your life in terms of it's not gonna kill you if you don't get it fixed, it does have a pretty significant impact on quality of life when you can't have sexual relations. So some of the symptoms include things like penile pain, but the curvature is the thing that usually brings the men in. So there are all kinds of treatments that are available. The top left corner talks about oral medications. People talk about things like vitamin E, Pataba, all kinds of things. They've never been proven to work. So 
you can try it, and usually we use it to buy time so that the curvature settles out and calms down before we go in and do something more definitive. Uh, traction therapy can sometimes help. There are a variety of injections into the lesion itself that have been noted to help, although none of them have been FDA approved. And ultimately, if they fail all therapies, we're gonna be taken to the operating room to straighten this thing out. Now, that is until 2013 when the FDA approved a medication called Zyaflex, which is a collagenase enzyme that is injected into the lesion of the penis. As you can imagine, with an enzyme, you're trying to dissolve some of this plaque at its point of maximal curvature. So with the two photos here, the top one has about a 45 to 60 degree upward curvature. The point uh, where the marking is is the point of maximal curvature, and after approximately six treatments where they can receive a maximum of eight, they're down to about 15 to 20 degrees, which is a lot more usable than a 45 to 60 degree curvature. In the clinical trials that led up to this medication being approved, they had about a 30 to 40% uh, improvement on average for curvature. In real world settings, for normal guys like me using this medication, the response has been pretty similar. So this medication does have some side effects. It can cause quite a bit of bruising if injected into the wrong location. There can be swelling, there can be pain, and the most dramatic side effect that you could have or complication is gonna be a penile fracture. So we advise all of our patients to avoid having any sort of penetrative intercourse for at least two to three weeks after the second injection. So as a whole, this disease is relatively prevalent. If they come and see you for this, refer them to urologists, get them down the right pathway. All right, let's talk about testosterone replacement therapy. I'm not gonna actually talk about the diagnosis because you all are very familiar with that. I'm not gonna talk about the type of medications you use because there's only so many available in the market. What I wanna talk about today is actually the controversies that are out there. So number one, being on testosterone therapy does not cause prostate cancer. And we actually have very good evidence for that. The original studies that came in the 1940s from Huggins and Hodges actually had a total N of six people. And based on those studies there with those six patients that they observed, it's been a long tradition of <laughs> avoiding testosterone because of the concern for causing prostate cancer. So once again, it does not cause prostate cancer. In fact, men who chronically have low testosterone have a higher risk of developing prostate cancer and having higher grade prostate cancer at that. So something to be aware of. The current literature moving forward is also showing that there's increasing evidence that it is actually safe to give men testosterone even if they have a history of prostate cancer. So stay tuned for that. The second thing is testosterone therapy can suppress fertility and spermatogenesis. I think that one of the most important questions you can ask any man who you are planning to start testosterone on is, are you planning to have children? And if they are, you may want to refer them to a urologist or an endocrinologist for evaluation, for treatment, because we do have other treatment options available for treating low testosterone. I did a survey when I was in fellowship of the urologists across the United States, and 25% of the respondents, including male infertility specialists, actually would give testosterone to a man who is trying to have children. So even urologists aren't really aware of this, so something to be aware of for you guys. And then the last thing is that there's no definitive evidence that being on testosterone increases the incidence of venothrombotic or cardiovascular events. In fact, we as the urologic community treat a lot of men by lowering testosterone, especially if they have metastatic prostate cancer, and there's actually a higher incidence of venothrombotic events in these men who have chronically suppressed testosterone. So the three things, number one, testosterone replacement therapy does not cause prostate cancer. Number two, if they're still considering fertility, please, please, please don't start on testosterone. And number three, there's no definitive increase in cardiovascular or venothrombotic events. All right, let's briefly talk about inf male infertility. This affects 15% of couples who are trying to have children, and then about half of the, uh, the cause is from the male side. So my call is if you do see a you know, a wife, the wife of a couple who's coming in because they can't have children, make sure you get a hold of the man as well and get them both referred to their respective specialists for treatment and evaluation at the same time. It can save a lot of trouble. Um, you know, men are very hard to get in the clinic. This is a way to get them into the, uh, into the doctor's office and we may be able to also find other secondary issues that may be the cause of their infertility. And once again, don't start on testosterone if they're trying to have kids. All right, the last thing on the docket, BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia. So. As a man, as I get older, I'm probably gonna have a hard time going to the bathroom. If you get old enough, your prostate's gonna grow, it's gonna restrict the flow, there's gonna be issues, okay? So there are all kinds of things that we can do, and as primary care uh, providers, I think you guys are very, very well versed in treatment, you know, tamsulosin, finasteride, doxazosin, all those medications I think are very, very useful. But what happens if those medications don't work? Where can they go? That's where the urologists come in. So, 
you know, there are office procedures that we can do, things like microwave therapy, needle ablation. We can do endoscopic procedures. We can go in there and do the rotorooter or the transurethral resection of the prostate. We can use lasers to ablate the tissue. We can even take them to the operating room and do a subtotal prostatectomy by removing only the pulp on the inside, if you will, and leaving the rind behind the capsule. So in the last five years, there have been two brand new procedures that have come into the market that have changed a little bit of the paradigm of how we approach BPH and have an adjunct between medication all the way, the bridges between medication and doing a transurethral resection of the prostate. I think w two of the issues that men can have after a transurethral resection of the prostate is the inability to ejaculate and the high risk for erectile dysfunction. So these two procedures have kind of mitigated that by being a lot less invasive and also preserve their erectile function and their ejaculation. So the first one is something called Urolift. It uses uh, steel tabs and nitinol wire in order to pull the lobes of the prostate apart, thereby opening up the channel so there's less resistance in there. This can be done in the office or in the operating room, and the whole procedure usually only takes about five to 10 minutes to do. However, it is limited to prostate glands of 80 grams or less. So the normal prostate glands about 20, maybe 30 grams, this is the 80. And oftentimes we'll see men upwards of 250 to 300 grams. So that kind of gives you a kind of a relationship in terms of the sizes that we're dealing with. So with the, the right patient, this can be a pretty good um, a treatment option for them. Now, uh, these uh, tabs are MRI safe. Um, the only hesitancy that we have in placing this is that we don't like leaving foreign bodies within the urinary tract because ultimately these foreign bodies can be a nidus for stone formation. And if anyone's ever dealt with stones, these are not fun, okay? So the outcomes are actually pretty decent. It, this device originally was approved in Australia. It was approved here in 2013 in the United States, and so we're having good five-year data that's coming out, and it actually looks pretty promising. Some of the other complications, it can cause blood in the urine, pelvic pain, burning with urination. The last thing I want to talk about is something called Resume. Resume is a therapy that was approved about four years ago, 2015, by the FDA, and it uses steam therapy in order to cause cell death and ultimately tissue atrophy. Um, the, <clears throat> the treatment is done in the office. It only takes probably about five minutes once you put the scope in there to do after a prostatic block, um, and it's actually pretty effective. It is also limited by size, so if the prostate gland is bigger than 80 grams, the patient is probably not a good candidate for it. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and it can also be done in patients who are on anticoagulation. Uh, the studies at the three year are actually pretty good. Both of these treatment options, the hope is that once it's completed and the patient uh, uh, has responded to it, we can get them off the medication so we can avoid the side effects of them. Uh, it also has some potential side effects such as dysuria and blood in the urine. So once again, for BPH, as we get older as men, we're gonna have problems with our prostates. There are many treatment options available. We even have some new technology that's available here at Loma Linda. So once again, I thank you so much for your time. Uh, men's health is a very important part of urologic care. There's many quality of life issues that we have to deal with, but there are available treatment options. If there's any concern about things, please refer your patients to your urologists earlier rather than later. Thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> These are my disclosures. And what I'm gonna talk about today is we'll start by talking a little bit about some kidney stone data. We'll talk about uh, some things we're trying to do to make kidney stone surgery safer. And then we'll talk about some research on improving our efficiency and cost. As we all know, stones are very common. Worldwide, there's 12% incidence. And of concern, this incidence is increasing significantly, 16% from 1997 to 2012. And it's increasing in children, it's doubled, and it's increased 45% in women. If we look at the year 2015 and the 22 million stones that presented during that year, there was about 16,000 deaths. Pretty impressive statistics. But if you remember that when we do a CT scan to diagnose and treat kidney stones, there's a one in a thousand chance that the patient will ultimately develop a cancer and potentially die from that cancer. So we have to be careful that we don't make the diagnosis and treatment worse than the disease itself. 
Currently, it's estimated in the U.S. that up to 2% of the cancers we're diagnosing right now are a result of ionizing radiation from medical imaging. And the FDA has issued a white paper calling for all of us as physicians to reduce the radiation exposure to patients. Stone patients are extremely high risk because they get radiation during the diagnosis of their stones, during the fluoro for treatment, and during their follow-up. And they tend to be young patients, and they can get recurrences. So let's talk a little bit about what we're doing to try and improve this process in stone patients. Well, the first thing is, how do we manage our patients who present with relatively small kidney stones? That could be for a trial of passage. For years, we've been using the medication Flomax, Tamsulosin, and the evidence has suggested it has very low side effect profile, it's well accepted, and it works quite well, spontaneously improving this passage rate by about 65%. But very recently, there's been two pretty well-designed trials that have raised questions about the efficacy of Flomax. The SUSPEND trial, this is from Britain, published in Lancet, um, had about 1,200 patients and showed no benefit. Another study in the U.S. with f over 500 patients, once again, showed really no benefit for Flomax. I think this very recent study from the University of Wisconsin kind of puts things in perspective. And what they did is they informed patients of all the information, gave them all the data, and then asked them, what would they like to do? Do they want to go straight to surgery, or do they want a trial of passage? 71% said they still wanted a trial of passage. And that's what we're doing here in our practice also. Now, not all stones are a good candidate for a trial of passage. And if you look at this CT scan as we scroll through, you'll see that this patient has had a lap band procedure. Obesity is a known risk factor for stones. You'll see they have a very large stone in the renal pelvis. They have some stone in the lower pole. But there's also a calcified object running the whole length of the ureter. That was a stent that got placed and forgotten about, and it's been in there now for four years. You can see there's also a large stone in the bladder. So this is a, a very large problem. Well, in the old days, we would take about 20 minutes of fluoroscopy to treat this stone. But this is a new technique I'm going to show you, where we employ ultrasound to map out the kidney, to make sure there's no overlying organs between us and our access point to the kidney, and select a site for entry. Once we've done that, we place a scope up into the kidney using a fluoroless technique. We find the calyx we want to access, and then using just a couple of taps of fluoro, we position a Kelly clamp on top so that the clamp and the ureter scope are lined up. And then, using a laser aiming beam that's on that image intensifier of the fluoroscopy, we can position the needle and insert it into the patient with no additional fluoroscopy. And the beauty of this is the surgeon can use his hand, he can feel the tap tactile feedback as the needle pops through the fascia and then goes through the collecting system without being radiated himself. And then here you can see in this inset picture, we can see under direct vision that we're inside the kidney. We know we're inside. We can drop a wire down. We can collect that wire with a basket from below and establish a very safe, reliable access into the kidney with very minimal amounts of fluoroscopy. Once we've got the wire through, we then make a little incision. We put a dualumen catheter to get a second safety wire in place. And once we have those safety wire in place, we pass a balloon to dilate the tract into the kidney. And over that balloon, we place a sheath that allows us repeated entry into the kidney. And this is all done under direct vision with no additional fluoroscopy. Once that access is established, we put in a specialized jackhammer. It's called an ultrasonic lithotripter. And you, as you see in this video, we can polish off that stone and liberate the stent that's inside. Once we clear all that up, we can then grab the stent and pull it out. What's been there for four years is now gone. There's still a few little bits of stone that we have to clear out from the lower part of the kidney. You'll see us go back in here in a moment, and we suck all those stones out. We use a flexible scope to look around in all the different crevices of the kidney to make sure all the stone is removed. And this technique, I'm happy to inform you, is very successful, and it's quite easy to perform. And with this, we were able to reduce our radiation exposure from a mean of about 39 millisieverts. That's for perspective, that's about how much you would receive if you were three kilometers away when they dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And we reduced that to about uh, half of what a plain KUB x-ray would be. We're currently working with our incubator on campus to develop a specialized needle that'll even further simplify this process. Well, it's not just the patients that are receiving this radiation exposure, but it's also the surgeons who are doing the cases. And we wear lead gowns and we feel like we're pretty safe. But there's mounting evidence that shows maybe we're not quite as safe as we think we are. 
Fluorotechnologists, we know, get about two and a half times the incidence of brain cancer. They get more melanomas, more breast cancer. We know that physicians who use fluoroscopy in their work get six times the incidence of brain cancer. So we got to wondering, really, how safe are we underneath our lead gowns? So we decided to perform some research to answer that question. We used a cadaver, and we placed TLD chips at strategic sites, both underneath the lead and in the sites that are normally not shielded by the lead. And what we found was the lead works pretty well. It blocks out 95% of the radiation, but that means 5% is still coming through. But we found even more concerning was that the parts that were unshielded, like the head and the legs, are getting a tremendous amount of radiation exposure. Well, does it matter if your leg gets radiation exposure? The answer is yes, it does matter. This is a study published out of circulation in 2017. They looked at vascular surgeons doing a single case, fully leaded, of endovascular repair. And at the end of that one case, in their blood was genetic damage to their DNA. So, <clears throat> it's not just the legs that are not shielded, it's also your head. Your head is pretty important too. So, and part of your head is your eyes. This is a study where they looked at interventional cardiologists. They did slit lamp exams. They took uh, 69 nurses, 58 cardiologists, and then age match controls. The incidence of posterior subcapsular lens changes, cataracts, was 50% in the interventional cardiologists, 41% in the nurses, and less than 10% in age match controls. So what can we do to protect our eyes? Well, is wearing lead glasses enough? We decided we would study that too. So once again, we went back to the lab, we used our cadaver model, we placed TLD chips in the eyes and the brain, and we found that it did significantly reduce, wearing lead glasses reduces your radiation exposure to your eyes, but not by 95%, only by 50%. And it had no effect on the radiation exposure to the brain. So we still have a problem. We also wanted to know, does the surgeon's height matter? We took the mean height of the average female surgeon and the average male surgeon, five foot two and five foot 10, and we did simulated percutaneous and frostalothotomy procedures. And if you look at this graph, it's a little scary. If you're the five foot two surgeon, you get a dramatic increase in radiation exposure to your eyes and all points in the brain. Another problem we face, a challenge in endourology, is we operate in a dark room. We have multiple petals on the floor, underneath the drapes, hidden in this dark room, and we try and step on the right one. Sometimes we don't get it right. And if we don't get it right, it can have disastrous complications. There's reports of fires, operative fires, burns, and even tragic uh, patient deaths. So we wanted to see if we could work on this problem and help solve this. And we came up with something we think works pretty well. And that is using a black light. So the problem is if you just turn the lights in the room on, you can't see your screen and it's sort of blinding. It ruins your dark adaptation. Well, by using a black light, it has no effect. We showed in our study on dark adaptation. And with these fluorescent petals, as you can see, we put little fluorescent stickers on the petals. Our activation time was faster. We made less mistakes. And uh, this was statistically significant. So I think this shows some promise for making surgery safer. Another problem we have in, in uh, all of healthcare in the US is the great cost. It's currently 18% of our gross domestic product. We spend more than any country in the, in the world, more than $10,000 for every person in the US. And yet, when we look at uh, survival statistics, we're only number 31 in the world. Our patients have long waits, they're getting frustrated. So we wanted to see if we could make our patients a little happier, get a little better patient satisfaction. And so one thing we tried in the clinic was using two-way radios. These are radios kind of like you see the Secret Service using to keep the president safe. And in this uh, panoramic picture here, you can see we have physicians working at several different points in the clinic. This allowed us to communicate immediately with each other to keep the flow of patients moving. And we showed that we were able to reduce the time from when we finished seeing the patient until they received their paperwork and ready to go by two-thirds. This resulted in a significant improvement in patient satisfaction, and my physician ratings also went up significantly, which was rewarding. Of course, one of the challenges was the construction workers at the new hospital also have figured out the benefits of the two-way radio system, so we had to, had to uh, have a little bit of conflict with them. <laughs> Another problem in healthcare today is hospital-acquired infections. These cost uh, almost $10 billion per year, a real problem, our hospital recently decided to do something about it. So we got these flat typing keyboards that are easy to wipe off and should theoretically reduce the risk of infection, although there's never been any studies showing that they do that. So we found that they were a little bit hard to type on. 
So we did a study, and we actually took 40 surgeons and nurses in the perioperative area. We had them submit to randomized crossover study, looking at their ability to type. And what we found was kind of alarming. They were 16% less efficient with these flat keyboards, and they made 5% more errors. So uh, we calculated all the typing done by the urology service for, the, for a month, and we extrapolated that for a year, and we realized that that would, be, that would come up to 19,000 errors. And in case you think errors are not a problem, errors account for 220,000 deaths in the US, dwarfing in hospital acquired infections by a huge amount. They're the third leading cause of death, and just medication errors alone are 40 billion, four times more than hospital acquired infections. So in conclusion, we're continuing to use Flomax. We're working to reduce the radiation exposure our patients get and to improve the safety of surgery and the efficiency of taking care of patients. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> thanks guys. That, those are just wonderful lectures getting through a lot of information very quickly. So at this time, I would like to, uh, you can ask questions, you can debate them on any of the points that they brought up that you disagree with, you can compliment them, anything you'd like. Any questions for any of the panel? How do you deal with the increased hematocrit on um, the um, testosterone therapy? Uh, great question. So unfortunately, any form of testosterone you give will stimulate the bone marrow to create more red blood cells. So there are a couple things that you can do. Number one is you can lower the dosing. Uh, usually patients aren't very happy about that. Uh, the other option is to send them to hematology and have them start uh, doing therapeutic phlebotomy. Um, you know, occasionally, if these patients are already donating blood, they can continue on that, but once they find out they're on testosterone, they usually make them stop because uh, testosterone is not a substance they like having in their uh, donor blood. I don't have a good answer for it. There's no medication that can reduce it, unfortunately. What's the uh, uh, incidence of spontaneous resolution of Peyronie's disease? Yeah, it's pretty rare. When I was in residency, it was a third got worse, a third stabilized, and a third improved. I've never seen a one-third improvement. It's probably less than 10 to 15 percent. I was just wondering about testosterone, the indications and advantages since there. Can you rephrase that again? Uh, comment on the advantages or benefits of testosterone. Why, which guy did you give it to? Which guy? So if they're symptomatic, so per the uh, American Neurologic Association that actually just convened the testosterone panel last year also, so 2018 was pretty busy for uh, men's health. If they are symptomatic, so you know, sexual uh, side effects, so if they're having erectile dysfunction, uh, decreased libido, uh, weight gain, poor concentration, fatigue, and their testosterone is less than 300 nanograms per deciliter, then that is the type of patient that I would treat. On the device, used to squeeze the prostate that looks like a single piece of uh, suture, I forget the name of it, with the plates Eurolift, on the either yeah. side of it. Oh, Urolift. Urolift. Yeah, yeah. Urolift. Do you get, I didn't see prostatitis as a problem with that. It would seem like it would be a nidus or infection. Uh, that is potentially that? true, yes. I didn't have a list on there, but yes, prostatitis is a potential complication of any of these procedures. It'd be the same thing for TERP, it'd be the same thing for Resume. Uh, if you don't have MRI available, What's the usefulness of a combination of total PSA, PSA velocity, free PSA, and PSA density <laughs> to kind of categorize what uh, low-tech, you know, uh, rural-type situations? The, uh, the studies on the free and total PSA is typically in patients who have had a repeat or have already had one biopsy. Uh, so technically, the utility of free and total is in somebody who's already had a negative biopsy. However, if uh, the PSA, it gets a little um, uh, uh, complicated, but the PSA density, I think, has been probably, of the PSA kinetic values, the PSA density has been found to probably be the most predictive. Uh, we use a PSA density if they've been diagnosed with prostate cancer of less than 0 0.15 um, as have being you know, higher risk of cancer. Uh, but I think a velocity uh, and a free and total um, and density are all adjunctive measures in addition to some of these other um, um, you know, commercially available um, uh, metrics. Yeah, and just one more comment on that. PSA velocity of 0.7 nanograms per mil per year for uh, uh, three PSAs over two years. And um, 
Then there is a test now called a prostate health index, which is for PSA of four to 10, where if you have a mildly elevated PSA, you can get that to try to refine the risk even more. But it's just a simple blood test through any major lab. But I think knowing the PSA velocity is important because we know from a lot of the large uh, studies that even having a PSA less than four does not, uh, you know, your rate of cancer is still, you know, 15% in the patients that they biopsy for any cause. So seeing a high PSA velocity in somebody with an absolute uh, number that's low is still cause for concern. Please, for just a quick consult, not exactly related to this, but I have a 72-year-old friend 250 pounds, very active, and he says at night he gets up three times a, pe a night to urinate, but he has hot flashes after he pees. Every night after he urinates, he sweats. What, and I, what do I need to do to tell him to tell his doctor? Uh, who, who, okay, Ed, you're going for the microphone. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, you know, the hot flash thing is, is kind of uh, unique. I haven't heard of that, but uh, given his size and his weight, I would probably have them get checked for sleep apnea. I think one of the things that we get a lot of are patients who have mostly nighttime urinary symptoms where they're waking up three to five to seven to 10 times a night, but during the daytime they're doing just fine. Unfortunately, there's no medication that's gonna really improve that. You can try anticholinergics, but they're still gonna wake up. So I'd say if they're at risk for sleep apnea, screen them for sleep apnea because if that's not treated, it doesn't matter what prostate medication we put on them on, it doesn't matter what surgery we do to them, they're still gonna wake up. And the whole premise behind that is if someone's struggling to breathe, they're apneic, it's gonna increase the uh, pulmonary pressure, the cardiac pressure, and then it's gonna cause diuresis. So get that screened out. The other thing I would recommend checking is checking his testosterone levels because he may have low testosterone. If you have a patient that's a stone former and has a known hypercalciuria of greater than 300 milligram for 24 hours, uh, what is your treatment for that? Um, so hyper, you said hypercalciuria? Yeah. Yeah, so hypercalciuria is very common, and um, your, your instinct is, well, I want to cut back on his calcium, but that's actually probably not the right thing to do. And in fact, they found that cutting back on calcium too much um, can increase your risk for stones. So usually what we do is we start with aggressive fluid therapy. Turns out there's all these causes of, of too much calcium in the urine. You want to rule out hyperparathyroidism and you know some of the, the rare things. But the most common situation, the best thing to do is just aggressively hydrate them. You can place them on empiric citrate therapy, which is an inhibitor of stone formation, or have them drink lemonade or diet lemonade. But um, if in very severe cases, if they're very active stone formers, we'll put them on chlorothaladone, you know, a small dose of chlorothaladone, like 25 milligrams, maybe even 12 and a half milligrams to start with once a day. And that will dramatically reduce the amount of uh, calcium in the urine. How much salt is too much salt in stone formers, especially people with hypercalciuria? So salt, salt is a real issue, and it, it does definitely increase the risk for stones. It um, increases your secretion of calcium. So, so uh, when I have a, st a recurrent stone former for their second stone formation, I send off a stone panel, a risk, Euro risk, uh, to this company called Litholink, um, which is based in Chicago. And they, they tell us exactly how much all the compounds are, including how much sodium is in the urine. And if there is too much, that's an important thing to cut back on. So probably two grams of sodium in the diet a day um, is, is enough, and more than that is probably undesirable. Uh, this question here for, for Dr. Hugh. You know, we look at the meta-analyses of the studies for yearly PSA, it, it shows really there's no mortality benefit. And so, you know, that's been a big controversy, of course, over the years. But to me, it seems clear that uh, a PSA is really, it's really not a great tool for the future of prostate screening. What, what is the future? Is it, is it starting to look like maybe the MRI is gonna be the future for prostate screening as, as you see it? Um, you know, the PSA is kind of our, our Achilles heel. It's what we have and it's what we've used. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure around PSA in terms of what the data has shown and what, uh, what is out there in the community. So I think it's, it's, it'd be tough to just kind of throw it out altogether. I think some of it is using PSA kinetics. Uh, some of it is using genomics. Uh, but I think MRI is very encouraging, uh, and especially with some of the newer studies looking at the economic viability of doing a non-contrast MRI of the pelvis in, in a more of a population-based standpoint. Uh, we're not there yet, but, uh, um, but that, that is probably where I'd see things. But, but I would like to say that 
you know, he did show two studies that showed an improvement in mortality with PSA screening. And just because you get a PSA doesn't mean you have to have a biopsy. Your PSA at age 40 is actually predictive of PSA mortality. So if you have a PSA that is above average at that point, that it can be a, a, an, an indicator. Um, then with all the other PSA isoforms that we have that are being studied, that's a adding power to PSA. And then if you compare a PSA test costs a few dollars and an MRI costs hundreds of dollars. So I don't think we're, MRI screening may be the future when we're using it for other things. I doubt prostate will lead the way because of the economic implications. A twofold question about stone formation. What's the mechanism that explains why obese patients are more prone to them? And then the second question, is there good evidence that keeping the urine dilute decreases stone formation? Okay, so um, obese patients have multiple risk factors. And um, so if you think of a person who has a lean body mass of a, whatever, 150 pounds, and they weigh currently 300 pounds, in order to maintain that weight, they're eating two or three times the normal amount of everything, everything, calcium, all the other food substances that are in the food. And so if they're drinking the same amount of water, everything gets concentrated. So that's one issue. They also have the metabolic syndrome with, with all the other pre-diabetic changes, which is a risk factor for kidney stones, and hypertension, which is a risk factor for kidney stones. So there's all, you know, all these other things. They tend to eat too much salt. So, so uh, it's multifactorial. Um, so the, uh, what was the second question again? Does keeping you, yeah. Well, that, that's a great question. And um, there's actually, you know, it's the mainstay of treatment for stones, but there's actually almost no information on it. There's been two studies that did show benefit. And uh, I would tell you in my practice, I, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the sun coming up in the morning. There hasn't been a lot of studies showing that the sun is going to come up in the morning, and yet we still all know that it is true. And we definitely know that even though there hasn't been a lot of great studies showing that hydration redu reduces stone risk, I can tell you I've had, I had a patient uh, who had had, a stone, had about 10 to 15 stones a year, and he was an engineer, extremely compulsive. He came into my clinic. I got him Lithalynx. I showed him. I told him I wanted to make his, his urine volume four liters. He made his urine volume six liters and has never formed a single stone since. So, uh, so I can tell you it, it, it definitely does work. We have two more questions, one here, one down there, and then we'll have to call it time. My question is, when is the appropriate uh, time to order the uh, MRI? And is it when we suspect um, prostate cancer when there's an elevated PSA? Mm -hmm. Or if we do order MRI, um, who is the one who's ordering it? Is us the primary care, or should we refer to urologists? If we order, what kind of order would it be? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I think some of that's evolving and sometimes uh, dependent upon, uh, you know, the payer and the insurance. Uh, uh, I, I think still as a screening study, the PSA is, is necessary. I think an MRI without a PSA would be um, uh, um, unnecessary because if they have a very low PSA, like Dr. Ruckel was saying, we're starting to move the PSA earlier. At least a lot of the urologic studies are saying, you know, single PSA early. Um, so if the PSA value or any of the kinetics are abnormal, um, you know, and you're in a facility with, with this technology, I think uh, it, it is a, a useful adjunct to, to the biopsy. So it, at, at earliest would be after an elevated PSA or sort of abnormal PSA kinetics. Uh, but, but typically it is the urologist because I think some of it is, um, there, there's a lot of nuances and other tests that can be done uh, in lieu of it um, in addition to the good old fashioned uh, digital rectal, which I think a, a, a well done rectal exam is, uh, you know, uh, really informative sometimes. Yeah, that's what my community has been doing, you know, ultrasound and biopsy. But if, if I were to order the MRI of the prostate, how do I order it? What kind of, you know, MRI of the prostate? How do I order yeah, it? So it's, uh, I mean, we order it here, it'd be a, a pelvic MRI, it'd be with, okay. with gadolinium. Um, you know, the, the, the same type of caveats in terms of metal fragments or, or any claustrophobia. Um, and we, we have a specific protocol in place that we, we've done a lot of work on. If the patients need to have a biopsy, that, that it's kind of streamlined. And, and then just one more thing on that. You, you really need a radiology team or a specialized radiology 
uh, radiology readers because even amongst radiologists, if they're not specialized, there's a lot of variability between interpretation. And so it's been shown in the urology literature that specialized prostate MRI radiologists are what is really best practice. Okay, quick question again regarding kidney stone formation. Is there evidence that switching to a non-dairy diet reduces stone formation, especially calcium stone formation? Um, I just, uh, interestingly, just reviewed a paper from China, a huge prospective study, and they looked at um, the amount of calcium in the diet, and in China, in middle-aged to elderly Chinese, there's absolutely no effect uh, uh, depending on how much calcium is in your diet. Now that flies in the face of the conventional studies from the U.S. Uh, there's been very, you know, large, uh, you know, health professional study and a nursing study that have all shown uh, moderate calcium diet uh, decreases your risk. So the low, the low calcium diet actually increases your risk of stones. So, so you want a moderate calcium diet. And, you know, as far as the source of the calcium, um, it looks like supplements are probably not good. Uh, supplements increase your risk. There are evidence that taking calcium supplement pills will increase your risk. So probably natural sources are probably better. And I usually tell my patients to take two uh, servings, maybe three servings of dairy a day. And if they can time it with meals, that's probably ideal because then it binds the oxalate in their diet and they absorb less. So, you know, two servings of milk, yogurt, whatever else. Okay, uh, again on that, um, I've heard preventive medicine specialists say that the problem with milk is that it acidifies the urine and so you excrete out more calcium. Is there any evidence for that? Um, I, none, none that I'm aware of. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, people who consume dairy two times a day have less incidence of stones. That's, that's what I know. So uh, Less incidence. Less incidence, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Koh, Dr. Baldwin, Dr. Hu, and Dr. Ruckel. Your um, efforts here at a different format, I think, were extremely successful. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>